Cliff Nesteroff is a comedy historian and expert who currently calls Hollywood, California home. Originally from Slocan, British Columbia, Nesteroff made a name for himself as a stand-up comedian and then a journalistic writer. In 2015, Grove Press published Nesteroff's remarkably comprehensive book, The Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy, which received acclaim from critics, readers, and comedians themselves. Nesteroff's latest project is a TV series for Viceland called Funny How, which examines aspects of comedy like bombing, breaking in, comedy classes, and niche comedy from the LGBTQ community and also Christian comedians. Here now is a clip from the first episode about bombing. The Gladstone Hotel. I bombed here. It's so fucking cold. First year I lived in Los Angeles, I got a sunburn on Christmas Day. It was the greatest Christmas of my life. I used to do stand-up here in Canada, but after seven and a half years, I quit and moved to Los Angeles to make my living as a comedy historian. I wrote a book called The Comedians, and it's mostly about old dead guys. But now I want to know what it's actually like to be a comedian today. And I figure I'd start with a topic that every young comic has to face. The Cadillac Lounge. I bombed there. (laughs) I bombed here. A guy stormed the stage and dumped a pitcher of beer on my head. Everybody's a critic. Funny How is utterly fascinating and runs on Viceland from July 10th to July 14th at 11.30 p.m. Cliff and I had a chat recently uh, about uh, living in slow can and loving Mad Magazine. The unreleased book he wrote about the secret, salacious oral history of Hockey Night in Canada that, as I say, it was ultimately blocked from being published. It's a fascinating story. We talked about the importance of The Kids in the Hall, the Canadian comedy, why and how he wrote The Comedians, why there might be so much general interest in how comedy works these days, the drug LSD, the TV show Funny How, and much more. Sponsored by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Copy, this is Cliff Nesteroff on the 331st episode of Creative Control with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Cliff. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm very well. It's nice to have you on this show. Uh, I have to say, right off the top, I don't... Well, I, I don't know myself well enough to know that I don't always do this, but I like to gush a little bit. Okay. Right off the top. Your, your book, The Comedians, amazing. Just astoundingly great. Thank you. Just uh, I, just like so much information, and I, I'm a comedy uh, fan, but uh, just to have this book uh, and tell people about this book, I, I get excited thinking about the book. I'm a little excited just thinking about the book right now. I have to calm down. Yeah, you should calm down. That sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a book after all. And then uh, this series that we're going to talk about, Funny How, unbelievable as well. What I, I've seen uh, two of the episodes, and I thought they were... Fantastic. So we'll dig into all of those things, I'm sure. But uh, first of all, uh, I want to ask you where you are, where you are in the world. Where are you right now? I'm in uh, Hollywood, California, uh, uh, Hollywood proper, you know, in the, in the heart of Hollywood. I live in a uh, beautiful uh, 1920s building that at one point housed a filmmaker named Jack Arnold. Oh. Jack Arnold. Jack Arnold made the movies uh, Tarantula, Creature from the Black Lagoon. They came from outer space, Monster on the Campus, The Space Children, The Incredible Shrinking Man, and many other uh, seminal 1950s Hollywood drive-in movies. Did he leave all his posters behind or something? You seem to know them off the top of your head. Well, uh, the same way you got excited about my book just now, that's kind <laughs> of how I got excited when I discovered that Jack Arnold used to live here, because I I always loved those movies. It's kind of, That's the kind of cool thing about living in Hollywood. Uh, It doesn't really matter where in the world you grew up. You are inundated with all kinds of popular culture that was made here. So uh, for me, if I wanted to this afternoon, I could walk down the the street 
and go to Bronson Caves where many of those scenes from those movies were filmed, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's sort of weird that the geography and the geology all around me is stuff that I saw at the age of two and three and four and five on television. So there's some sort of weird, partially nerdy, but partially spiritual thing to it that everything that I had uh, uh, embedded in my subconscious, uh, willingly or not, as a young man, I now see in a waking life. You know? Right. So it's a sort, of, sort of a strange thing. That's remarkable. I want to touch upon a couple of things you said there. First of all, I, I want to know how long you've been in, in Hollywood, uh, California. And secondly, when you mention being two, three, four, and five and seeing these uh, films uh, or being exposed to that culture, uh, where were you uh, at that point? I've been in Hollywood for five years. And when I was three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I was in uh, South Slocan, British Columbia, oh. and the mountains of the Slocan Valley. Okay, and and so you were raised in BC, I guess, is, is what you're saying. I I was raised in in rural British Columbia. Yes. And what was that like? It was very uh, isolated, very isolating, and very isolated. We got only one TV channel, the CBC, Mm -hmm. and we only got one radio station, the CBC. But at night, because we were in this sort of weird valley, this mountainous uh, region, at night you could get thousands of radio stations. And that was my portal to the world, was uh, going up and down the AM dial late at night and seeing what else existed in the uh, universe. So if I got a radio station from Sacramento or from Idaho or Salt Lake City, that was like exciting for me. And then of course, as the sun rised, you lost those radio stations and it was like, they never (laughs) existed, you know? Um, But I I didn't have access to uh, culture really in any, in any way. Not that I would have necessarily known the difference, but we did not grow up in a town. There was no town. It was a rural route and a dirt road huh. uh, near, a, near a logging route on a, on a highway. So there was logging trucks nearby and stuff. And there was a gas station about 15 minutes away. And at the gas station, you could buy Mad Magazine, which I did. But because I grew up in this sort of isolated area without access to movies or TV, everything I learned about movies and TV was from the Mad Magazine parodies. Right. So – they would make fun of an officer and a gentleman. It would be called an officer and a Gentile. And I would have no idea (laughs) what they were making fun of, who Richard Gere was, but I would sort of have a passing understanding of all these sort of uh, cultural touchstones. I knew who Richard Nixon was, but only because of Mad Magazine, you know? So it was sort of a weird backwards introduction to, uh, to things. So when I finally moved out of that area, I kind of overcompensated. I went to Toronto, I came to Los Angeles and just became absorbed in learning everything I could about film, television, literature, everything I never had access to because I was, uh, I guess, insecure that I would uh, come across as ignorant. You know? Yeah, no, I, I can appreciate that. Did you have a Mad Magazine uh, author or rather a, a illustrator or writer that you particularly liked? Yes, I still don't know how to pronounce his last name properly, but... Uh, Sergio Aragonese yes. or Aragones, yeah, I don't know how to say his last name, but he was my favorite because you didn't have to know how to read to enjoy his work. It was all pantomime, it was all silent, but he drew very evocative uh, images so you could really follow his storyline or his jokes. And I found his illustrations hilarious, especially the ones from late six, the late 60s where he would illustrate big fat cops beating the crap out of hippies. Yeah, uh, I found that extremely amusing for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so I loved, loved, loved his work. And uh, like I say, I've lived in Hollywood for five years and I've never really been starstruck. And I've been so fortunate to work and meet with many of my heroes uh, here. But I've been starstruck once. I did a show at a theater here with a guy named George Schlatter who created the TV show Laugh-In. Uh-huh. And we were doing a retrospective of his career and I was interviewing him about his connections to Frank Sinatra and producing shows for Judy Garland and then, of course, uh, Laugh-In. And in the audience that night was Sergio Aragonese and I was starstruck wow. by this Mad Magazine artist. He's got a giant, uh, almost like rolly fingers, curly mustache and uh, I recognized him immediately, and I lost it. I've never been a person who would ask for a photo with a celebrity. And I guess in many eyes, he isn't a celebrity. But in mine, he, he was. And I was, like, gushing at him, saying, you know, you have been making me laugh 
since before I could read. You know? and there's nobody else. <laughs> Nobody else in the world I could say that about unless I was being tickled by my father or something. So. <laughs> well, that's remarkable. I mean, what a life you've uh, led. I mean, you mentioned that you, you left rural BC for Toronto and Los Angeles. Uh, it sounds like, by the sounds of it, Mad was your gateway to comedy. You were an aspiring comedian at one point, right? Yeah, I started doing stand-up at the age of uh, 18. Uh, when I was 17, I think, yeah, when I was 17 at my high school, which was the 7th through 12th grade, one high school in the woods, a total of 400 kids, all grades. Huh. Um, it was pretty small. And everybody was bussed in from all the sort of mountain communities around there. A lot of kids had a one-hour bus ride there and a one-hour uh, bus ride home. So 400 kids, not a lot of students. Uh, I ran for school president in the 11th grade. Or sorry, grade 11, as you say in Guelph. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> don't mean to get too American on you, but... Uh, You've lost your roots, I, Cliff. What happened to you? Uh, well, you know, when, when in Rome, you got to you gotta <laughs> communicate properly, but... Speak as the Romans ran, do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I ran for school president, and it was a weird high school because it was such a obscure school in such a random area uh, uh, all the teachers that taught there had been like defrocked at other school districts and sent to our school to teach as sort of like punishment. It was like <laughs> they had some scandal in Vancouver and they couldn't teach in Vancouver anymore. So they sent them to the woods nine hours northeast of there. And so our English teacher had been involved in some sort of sexual harassment scandal. What? Our drama oh my God. <laughs> yeah, our, our drama teacher had, had done uh, pornography in the 80s. Uh, uh, our art teacher... I, it was a, maybe an urban legend, but they said that he huffed glue in the back room. And then our social studies teacher was definitely drunk most classes and had, <laughs> w w and had like uh, uh, post, I guess back then they didn't really uh, uh, diagnose PTSD, but he would be drunk in class and then reminisce about the war. And it was, he was like shell shocked, you know, he would, w the whole class would be him talking about, you know, seeing dead bodies. So anyways, when I ran for school president, I did this speech that kind of exposed all this uh, salacious, dirty laundry. And I said that God created our school in seven days. On the first day, he said, let there be a drama teacher who does softcore pornography. <laughs> on, the sec on the second day, let there be a, uh, an English teacher who is uh, suspended for sexual harassment. So I said all these things. And after each line, the whole student body went, ooh, like they got all excited. <laughs> and then by the end of it, I said, uh, as school president, I will not be able to do anything. My opponents have promised you things, but it's lies. A school president has no power. It can be overridden at any moment by a principal or, or, or a, 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 a faculty. So I can only make you one pledge and one pledge only, and that is if elected, I will be the coolest fucking school president this school has ever seen. <laughs> They all stood up, all 400 kids, and they cheered. And I had a, uh, a accomplice in the, in, the, in the office there, and he hit play on a cassette that went through the PA as I finished, and it played the theme music from Shaft. And I, <laughs> and I strutted off, and I won in a landslide, 400 votes to zero to zero. And uh, I was Im immediately immediately kicked out of school <laughs> and and so i didn't I, I didn't return for the next year and i never uh, graduated but that was like my first in, not intentionally but sort of my first ever stand-up performance and i destroyed and so about six months ten months later i moved to toronto i hitchhiked across the country in between huh. that time and then moved to Toronto and started doing a sitcom writing class there because I thought maybe that would be something I would be good at. But then it was the late 90s and television was not very good at that point. Mm -hmm. Seinfeld was leaving, leaving the air, but there was not yet this cable renaissance. So I was writing spec scripts for shows like Third Rock from the Sun. And uh, th th my scripts were good for, for what they were, but you had to like study third rock from the sun yeah and that that was not really enjoyable so i was like well there was a kid in my class who suggested i do stand-up and so i started doing stand-up in toronto and that uh for a while anyways became my calling and so i did that from 98 until 2006 and i had great success i moved to vancouver in 2001 and then all of a sudden everything clicked for me stand-up wise and uh, i had a a nice uh, spell of uh, adulation, a cult following, doing a, 
uh, stand-up act in Vancouver that got me a lot of press, which I am currently getting framed because now I'm proud of it now that I'm older. So sure. I was only 21, 22, 23, and it, it really clicked and hit there for a while. So, yeah. Okay. So and, at, at, at some point you transitioned sort of out of stand-up? I quit altogether in 2006 because – uh, I'm sure most Canadians realize it's not easy to make a living in show business in uh, in Canada. No matter how good you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter how long you've been doing it, it's it's a long slog, you know. And even yeah. if you do get like a good gig at the CBC, you know, it comes and goes. You know, you could lose your job at the CBC, and you're not likely to find a. Don't uh, I know it, Cliff? Don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that happened so, to me. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, unless you're Ralph Benmergi, you're not going to be a lifer at the CBC. So, anyways, <laughs> I don't know why I'm dissing Ralph Benmergi. Poor Ralph. Okay. Poor Ralph. Yeah, yeah that was that's him uncalled for, if I must say. I, that, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. That's I'm fine. Sorry. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I did stand up in Vancouver, and my, and I was getting a lot of attention, and a lot of press. I was on the the cover of the Georgia Strait and the cover of a lot of the free weeklies there, and. Got great reviews, got nice write-ups in the in the Globe and Mail and the Vancouver Sun, and you know I, I was getting recognized locally and and, and stuff like that. But uh, after seven or eight years of doing stand-up, I was making the exact same amount of money that I was the very first time I did stand-up, mm. namely zero dollars. Right. So that was a big struggle, and I refused to get like a, a job job because I wanted to focus on on stand-up and art and writing and stuff like that. And I just couldn't quite make a go of it. And then I, I suffered the same curse that many comedians have, which is the thing that makes you most popular, which was the act that I was doing, is the thing that you learn to hate. Right. You get tired of doing the same thing over and over. And with stand-up, in order to get good, you have to refine it. You have to do the same thing over and over and if you want to do something new it's a brand new starting from scratch learning process and it's a big uh, uphill climb so i was torn between these two worlds i could go up and destroy doing the same old act i was sick of or i could try something new that nobody liked uh, i was doing a character that was so popular at one point that when i tried to switch over and do something else the audience literally rejected it like my fans would yell at me and tell me to go back to the old stuff. <laughs> huh. Wow. Wow. So I, I don't want to compare myself to somebody like Jim Gaffigan, but Jim Gaffigan has had a similar experience where the thing that made him most famous was his routine about hot pockets. Yes. And he would go and do a concert and people would scream that out, hot pockets, hot pockets. And he didn't want to do that routine anymore. And he tells a story about how he would be like at a public event. Let's say it's 4th of July fireworks or something with his wife. And he would say, let's get out of here. And she would say, well, what's wrong? He goes, it's getting a little bit hot pockety around here. <laughs> Meaning that people would point at him and demand he do jokes about hot pockets. So I sort of had that issue with the act I was doing in Vancouver and, uh, so I, I kind of started to phase it out. I tried to switch gears, and it was okay, but I knew that it would be like another uh, several years of, of doing that in Vancouver. If I had been able to move to Hollywood or New York then at that point legally, I think it may have been different. But I did not have the wherewithal at that time yeah. to get a, a work visa or a green card or anything. So I switched gears and, and just focused on writing specifically primarily i could always get gigs writing at the cbc so i did that for uh several years it did not necessarily lead to anything but it paid the bills right and uh i was writing online a lot i wrote for wfmu which was sort of like a hip radio station here in the states mm -hmm. and i was writing their articles online they got me a lot of attention because they had a built-in kind of cool audience already yeah so it, yeah People gravitated towards uh, that site, read my stuff, and among the people that became uh, big boosters of mine through that uh, was Mark Marin. Mark Marin uh, was kind of smitten with these articles I had written about old comedians, so he had me on my sh on his show to talk to me about it. And by doing his show, I got a, a new agent and a book deal out of it. Oh, okay. And, and I was able to use the uh, species of the book deal to uh, move to Hollywood. Right. And so you wrote the, the book deal. I assume the book in question is The Comedians. Correct. Correct. You know, I, I did have another book deal in Canada at one point that fell through. 
And I don't, I don't even know if I should say it out loud because somebody else will take the idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you should. I don't, I don't want you to – don't get ripped off. <laughs> well, it happens. But I, I had, <laughs> I, I had a, a fail-safe idea for the number one bestseller in Canada. I wanted to make money in Canada, and I figured this was the main way to do it, that there was no way this could fail. And everybody I mentioned the idea to was like, that hasn't been done already? I go, no. They go, my God, that's the greatest idea of all time. That'll be the best-selling Canadian book of all time. I said, I know. And my agent agreed, and Penguin Books agreed, and Harper Collins agreed, huh. and then we and then we got sued, <laughs> and the book deal fell through. You got sued? Well, threatened with a uh, with a lawsuit by a very powerful Canadian entity oh. who said that if you who said if you go through with this book, we will do everything in our power to stop you. And it spooked Penguin Books, and it spooked scooped, spooked Harper Collins, and the book deal fell through. And I said, "Fuck it, I'm moving to America because if I can't make this happen, I'll tell you what the book is. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read this other book." Live from New York. It's an oral history of Saturday Night Live. Of course, Tom Shales and uh, right. the other fellow. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's a great book, right? It's yeah, a great absolutely. Book. Yeah. So I stole that idea and applied it to Hockey Night in Canada. Whoa! And I and I wrote the oral his the uncensored oral history of Hockey Night in Canada. And I I dug back deep and I interviewed everybody. The whole history of McLaren Advertising, the advertising company that designed the blue jackets, that designed the stick and puck logo. And I interviewed this guy. Uh, I don't know if he's still alive, named Maury Kells, who became like a PC a politician. Not politically correct, but a progressive conservative. Uh, <laughs> Important for our American and international yeah. listeners to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, exact he opposite worked, meaning, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He uh, he had worked at McLaren Advertising in the 50s when they had the Hockey Night in Canada account, and I interviewed him. And I go, well, what was it like in those days when you guys were coming up with the ideas for Hockey Night in Canada? He goes, well, I don't want to be redundant. I'm sure you've heard all the stories about all the – hookers and drugs in the office i go oh yeah yeah i have heard but please i'd like you to tell me more <laughs> and uh, of course i hadn't heard about that at all but it was amazing and i had all these great stories about bob cole what bob cole was really like about how he after every game he'd get drunk on jack daniels and ha run a bath and crank frank sinatra and you know and how the play-by-play -play, wow the <laughs> The, the color men weren't allowed to touch him during the show or otherwise he'd punch them. And he would, he would, he would call the game with his pants. He would take his pants off to get comfortable during the playoffs and call the game with his pants off. And, would, and there's all this stuff. And I had interviewed Dolores Clayman who composed the theme song. And I interviewed Ralph Mellenby who had been the producer at the time and got their opposing back and forth squabble about the theme song and how she got ripped off and all that stuff. And anyways, I wrote the whole arc of the history, at least the sample material, maybe 200 pages talked to everybody from uh from jim hewson to john garrett to uh i did interview dick irvin and oddly enough we talked a lot about charlie chan movies for some reason he loves charlie chan movies and so did i from the 40s okay um <laughs> yeah. i interviewed like 100 125 people every person you could imagine and uh penguin books was on it they were like oh this will be amazing um we'll 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 make this happen blah 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 but then they got overambitious. They said, let's contact the CBC and go into collusion with them. We can buy commercials during the Stanley Cup finals and billboards and, and it'll be the biggest thing. We'll have Ron McLean interview you uh, uh, in between the periods. <laughs> so we had this meeting. We went to the top floor of the CBC. This must have been 2009, maybe. We went to the top floor of the CBC. It was me. Uh, uh, the guy from Penguin Books, the head of CBC Marketing, the head of CBC Sports, and the head of the CBC. And so they, the guy from Penguin Books goes, well, Kickle, if you just pitch the idea to them, and if they ask you any questions you can't handle, you just look at me and I'll pick up the ball. I said, great. <laughs> so I, we're in this meeting, and I'm pitching to this guy named Ted Darling, the head of CBC Sports. And I'm, I made it real, like, uh, uh, maudlin, you know, in a way that I thought would appeal to the CBC. And I said uh, – Hockey Night in Canada united the country in a way that Confederation never could. You know? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> at one point, uh, this guy, Ted Darling, who's the head of CBC Sports, Hockey Night in Canada, he looks at me, he stops me, and he goes, the history of Hockey Night in Canada, who cares? Whoa. And I go, what? He goes, who cares? 
And so I look over at the guy from Penguin Books who said, if you can't handle the question, I'll pick up the ball. I look over at him. He's like panicking, shrugging, going, I don't know. <laughs> and so the whole meeting just like went to hell and they were really like antagonistic and stuff. I think they had like gotten wind of the salacious uh, um, attitude of the material sure. maybe. And, yeah. And so we're walking out of there and the woman from marketing was trying to like salvage it. And she goes, don't, don't worry about them. They're just like that. So we're going to do this and this and this. Cause the woman from marketing knew that this would make a huge amount of money for hockey night in Canada, a huge amount of money for CBC, a huge amount of money for penguin books and a huge amount of money for me. And I would have made the least amount of uh, any of those. Right, people. Right. But it was like, the idea is so perfect. Everybody would buy that book in Canada. Everybody would buy that book in Canada. But it fell apart, and they threatened us, and they said, if you go ahead, we'll, we'll stop you. We, owe the, we own the rights to the name, to this, to that, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll do our own book. And so and they came out with like a coffee table book two years later <laughs> that was like, great moments from Hockey Night. like some boring book that nobody cares about. Wow. And so that must have been heartbreaking. You wrote basically the whole thing, and they said it no. It was so heartbreaking because I was trying to do something for Canada. You know, I'm Canadian. I'm good at what I do. I thought, what could, we, what could I do for a Canada that would be cool? Because yeah. – Americans think Canada is cool, but Canadians don't think Canada is cool. So we look at Canadian show business as square and corny and embarrassing. There's no uh, film industry there outside of Quebec and the TV shows we kind of cringe at. You know, we all watch American TV in Canada. So I wanted to do something that was cool. And I thought that that oral history of Hockey Night in Canada would have been really cool. And also... It's a book that's only for Canadians. If I try and describe this project to anybody in America, they don't understand the cultural importance of Hockey Night in Canada, and there's no analogy that I can give them. Like Monday Night Football is not a equal analogy because not everybody watched that. Yeah. But in Canada, for a generation, we all had one TV channel. <laughs> right. Until you know, so it was different. It did unite the country. Well, I appreciate your perspective on Canada. There's in the episode of Funny How, uh, which is entitled Bombing, I believe. Uh, yeah. there's a moment where in the voiceover you you're you're talking to Toronto comedian Chris Robinson. Uh you're focusing in on him and at one point in the voiceover you say Canadian comedy awards don't mean shit. You have to move to LA, or maybe I'm maybe I just wrote that in my notes. But uh, <laughs> you essentially say something like that, right? Yeah, I say uh, uh, no offense, Canada, but in order to really make it in stand up, you have to move to the states. Yeah, I don't think I I don't think it's, I say it's shit. No, but it's but it's true. It's like if you remain in Canada as a comedian, you will always be part of the underground. In terms of uh, 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 what's the word magnitude? Yeah. In terms of magnitude, so the, I know people that book all the comedians here. People that book f comedians on the Tonight Show, on Stephen Colbert, and occasionally they'll be gracious enough to ask me, like, "Is there anybody you think I should see?" And I say, "You got to go to Canada," and I'll send them clips of c comedians that are well known in Canada, and they will say. How come I never heard of this person? It's like you're invisible as long as you're in Canada. So a guy like Graham Clark, who's a great comedian in Vancouver, if he were living in Los Angeles the past uh, however many years, he would be a very famous comedian here. But he's completely unknown here because they just don't get the exposure. You know? Do you think Graham Clark or Dave Shumka are not leaving Vancouver for any particular – I mean that's just their own self-momentum, right? They're just not making the move? No, well, maybe you'd have to ask them sure. To know for sure. But the legality, the, it's very difficult to get your working papers and your green card and stuff like that. It's very expensive. It's not an easy process. It costs money. You have to hire an immigration lawyer. Then there's a fee involved. There's no guarantee that you'll get in. And if you get declined, you know, you're out $10,000, 10,000 Canadian dollars. Yes. You know? So. It's uh, it's not simple. It's very, very complicated. So you really need to go. And of course, if you're born and raised in Canada, that's where your roots are. That's where your friends are. That's where your family is. So it's a big sacrifice to just pick up and split. But at the same time, it's very difficult to uh, get any kind of traction in America if you're not here. You know, when I was writing that Hockey Night in Canada book, 
I interviewed a guy named Murray Westgate. And Murray Westgate was the spokesman in the 50s and 60s in Hockey Night in Canada. He played a ESSO gas station attendant. And mm-hmm. he was the guy who did all the commercials. And I interviewed him for that book. And he was telling me just about moving from Saskatchewan to Toronto uh, in the 50s to become an actor. And he became well known. And he said something. It sounds like a corny old colloquialism or a cliche, but it's so true. He said, well, if I wanted to raise strawberries, I would have to move to where they raise strawberries. So the the meaning being that if you want to be in show business, you have to go to where they make show business. In Canada, that's Toronto, but really just barely. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, North, in North America, it means Hollywood or New York. So I've had some good success the past few years, and people – are very sweet and kind from Canada. They, they, they. I never know how to react. They congratulate me on it, and I uh, don't know how to react because really my success, if I've had any, is because of geography because I moved to Los Angeles. So now I get to appear on TV, but it's because I'm where they make TV. If I was still <laughs> living in the Slocan Valley doing exactly the same thing that I do as a writer or whatever – I wouldn't be on TV. So it really comes down to geography. I once saw Canadian uh, icon Gord Downey making a speech at the Juno Awards in Winnipeg. I was there covering it, and he said, uh, we all get the success we deserve. They were being inaugurated into like the Canadian Hall of Fame, and he just said this thing, we all get the success we deserve, which I thought was rather poignant. I think it kind of speaks to what you're saying. That sounds like the opposite. What does he mean? He was getting an award and said we all get the success. We oh, I see mean? what you're saying. No, I, <laughs> he wasn't being immodest. He was just suggesting that uh, he was actually being critical of uh, people wondering about their success. And uh, so on in some level, maybe he was boasting. But I also think <clears throat> it stuck with me, this notion of being driven. I took it as the opposite. I didn't take it as him being like, ha ha, we won and you didn't. I, I right. took it more as like, we're up here because we believed in ourselves and we worked hard and a lot of people work hard and believe in themselves and they, they're doing their best. And, and when you see them succeeding, it's because they deserve it. Um, so maybe you're right. But I don't know. I, did, I didn't think of it as a nefarious <laughs> or selfish comment. I thought well, of it, there, it was there's very... A, uh, there's, a patho- there's a pathology here in America that hard work, if you're successful, it's because of hard work. It's the greatest lie of all time. Yeah. Uh, success is only a result results because of one thing and that's good luck. Mm. And you can't, you cannot control good luck. People have good luck and they have bad luck. Uh, you cannot control it. But if you're patient long enough, eventually you will have some sort of good luck, but it's not hard work because you and I both know that lots of people work hard and they don't get good luck. They get bad luck. And so if, if, if hard work does not equate bad luck, like if somebody had bad luck, you would, you wouldn't say, Oh, it's cause that guy works hard. But if he has good luck, we say, Oh, it's cause he works hard, you know? So yeah, you, yeah. you can't, you cannot choose one or the other. So I really believe you can amplify your luck. I amplified my luck by moving to Hollywood. But ultimately, uh, it's not up to us, I don't think. You no, can be talented you, and you can work hard, but it, it just kind of happens or it doesn't. Yeah, but I think you're also – you've proven yourself to be rather driven, and I think you changed lanes. You went from – like a lot of comedians have been doing over the last 15 years. And as you document in, in your book, The Comedians, as new mediums came up, as new platforms emerged, comedians were rescued from obscurity. I was talking to Kevin McDonald of the Kids in the Hall today, and we were talking about his podcast – and about uh, and I referenced your your book uh, in terms of how radio when it, radio emerged, comedians suddenly had this outlet to uh, some comedians who had been left behind and thought uh, were sort of relegated to the sidelines suddenly had these platforms. I think of podcasting and I thought of podcasting when I was reading your section on on radio actually, and I don't right. know, I'm sure, sure you someone else has brought up that that parallel before. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's there's that aspect. You know, Ke- Kevin McDonald, <laughs> I love the kids in the hall so much. That's another thing here in America, the way I can't convey how important Hockey Night in Canada was to Canada. People in America will never understand the enormity and importance of the kids in the hall for Canadians. Yeah. Like, uh, that they were the biggest Canadian comedy stars of their generation and remain the most influential of their generation. And unlike so many 
uh, comedy stars or comedy shows of their generation, they still hold up, you know, yeah. which is a, which is a great testament to their, uh, potency. Yeah. But, uh, Kevin McDonald, I once saw, it was maybe w- when you guys were talking about the podcast, were you talking about how he has found like a resurgence, like a new audience where there was maybe not for a while. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah. Or? Essentially there was that aspect. And also the fact that he said he was just so sick of having people reject his ideas for a TV show that he just decided to go right. whole hog in this, this medium that uh, enables him to do whatever he wants. And as you listen to the podcast, I can, I can already hear it evolving. I can hear him getting more comfortable it's fascinating to listen to it in sequence because he's essentially come up with a very, I think, a rather unique variety show format in a in a world in a rather in a in a platform that is, you know, everyone's doing all sorts of things, but I I think what he's doing is is actually quite unique. I once saw Kevin McDonald. Here's the 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 sad side of uh, Canadian show business. I once saw Kevin McDonald on a TV show called. MTV Cribs Canada. <laughs> Not MTV Cribs, MTV Cribs Canada. <laughs> yes, yes. That, uh, I don't know if you could find that on YouTube, but it was, uh, I don't even know what to say. Well, <laughs> I think he, uh, yeah, he amplifies the sadder aspects of his life for comedy. And uh, Well, the weird thing is, when the Kids in the Hall series ended, they were the biggest stars in Canada. And everything they did in America, for me, and probably for most Kids in the Hall fans, was a step down. Yeah. So when you saw Dave Foley uh, hosting uh, a poker, you know, there was like a competitive competitive poker program he was hosting. And Kevin McDonald on MTV Cribs Canada, Bruce McCullough was directing... Uh, uh, you know, some some of the not so great SNL movies. Yeah. It, it was like uh, it was not a betrayal, but it was like god damn these guys should be the next step up not the next step down but maybe it's because the kids in the hall was as high as you could go right off the bat it was so strong and so great and i remember when news radio premiered uh, uh i was such a phil hartman fan yeah and such yeah. a and such a day foley fan that that show was like a huge disappointment because there was no way no way some network sitcom in the States was ever going to be as good or as funny or as cutting as the kids in the hall. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think only Scott Thompson made a really successful transition. He went from the kids in the hall to uh, the Larry Sanders show. My which favorite. Was made, yeah. Yeah. My favorite show of all time. Yeah. And it was probably the closest equivalent America had to comedy of that strength of the kids in the hall, the Larry Sanders show. So that was, that was a, a, a strong transition. But for all the rest of the guys, uh, uh, even Mark McKinney went and joined the cast of SNL for a year. I don't know if you remember that. And of course, he even used yeah. a couple of the Kids in the Hall characters on SNL, and it just didn't translate. It just didn't work. Their, their alchemy together as a unit um, you know, stands as strong as anything in the history of comedy in terms of just pure chemistry. Just just this perfect alchemy playing off of each other. And if you see them today even doing like a panel, even if it's not all five of them, even if it's just two or three of them together, the way they bounce off of each other and play off of each other, it's like they communicate with uh, like a comedic ESP. It's incredible. Yeah, I think you have to sometimes uh, painfully have to get away from your core to really know your core. And I think, you know, they were a little bit estranged. And then when they came back together, I think they all... Scott Thompson has told me, you know, that's it. We're in it for life. We know it. You know, this is us. Uh, this is yeah. who, this is who we are. And like I said, absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of, uh, you were talking about kids in the hall transitions into other things. I want to transition back into uh, your work from, you know, Mark Maron having you on uh, his show to talk about these uh, historical articles, in a sense that you were writing uh, for yeah. WFMU. This got you on the road to becoming. The author of the comedians, and uh, and then you are now known, I think, as a a comedy expert and historian. Is that fair? That's more than fair. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Well, that's see, that's another way. I you know, like I said, like I was saying earlier, with comedians kind of figuring out different roads to take to express their love of comedy or their love of the art. Yours is a very fascinating one because you went straight. Well, not straight, but you went from the stage to be, like being an active comedian to actually getting into the history. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned that you wrote this book about Hockey Night in Canada. So you have the writing chops 
why did you decide to write this whole entire amazing, first of all, I, I, let me just stress, and I can't stress it enough, amazing book, The Comedians? Well, you know, it grew out of, oddly enough, when I was writing that book about hockey night in Canada, I was getting up early in the morning because I had to interview people that were in Toronto and Montreal, and I was on the West Coast. So I got good at interviewing, uh, how do I say it gracefully, uh, the elderly. <laughs> 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 and I, I, I just took a liking to these old guys who had all these crazy stories and realized that you're kind of – uh, uh, racing the clock, you know, and a lot of those people I interviewed for that book that never happened have since passed away. Yeah. Um, and so it was really interesting to, to get that down. And then I thought maybe I should interview other people as well. When I interviewed that guy, Murray Westgate, he was involved with Hockey Night in Canada, but he was an actor. So he had show business stories, which I was already interested in. So I interviewed a couple uh, uh, other people. Uh, just aside from that, I interviewed a guy named Larry Storch, who was an old comedian who did a lot of sitcoms, and uh, uh, a guy named Woody Woodbury, who I had records by that I would buy in thrift stores that used to say adults only on them, but they were very <laughs> innocuous comedy records from the early 60s. So uh, I started interviewing them, and I started to get good at research and good at, at talking to people and mining them for material and I would transcribe these interviews and I would post them online with no intention of turning them into anything. And slowly but surely, I did more and more of that. And around that same time, Google put up a newspaper archive, Google News Archives. And I would do research using the Google News Archives. And it led me into this world of uh, uh, old Miami Beach newspapers that had entertainment listings for hundreds and hundreds of nightclubs with photos of comedians and like strippers named Bubbles Duvall performing with Joey Bishop and stuff like this. And I, I was like, what is this? Like, I didn't really know anything about this universe and incrementally learned that there was this whole mid-century universe of show business that is sort of undocumented. Las Vegas before Las Vegas, Miami Beach, where hundreds of comedians would perform, hundreds of strippers would perform, hundreds of singers and dancers would perform, all in that post-war uh, period. So I started investigating it, interviewing people about some of these clubs. I became very interested in this place called Martha Ray's Five O'Clock Club because I found an interview with Shecky Green where he said everybody was high on drugs <laughs> yeah. in this club, including Errol Flynn. And so I started seeking out the people that performed at these clubs and just started interviewing them, screen grabbing things off those Google News Archive uh, newspapers, posting them on a blog online, and it just started to generate attention. And because a lot of these people were very obscure, guys like Jack Carter, Will Jordan, Shecky Green, all characters in my book, um, that after a while, if you Googled their names, the very first hit that would come up was my uh, blog. Because oh. they were obscure. So it generated all kinds of traffic towards me from America and Canada and Europe of anybody who was curious or interested in these people. And then I wrote an article about Shecky Green that was sort of a composite of all of these interviews. Because all of these old guys would tell me the same thing. They would say, Shecky Green was the funniest comedian of all time. Shecky Green was the craziest, most original comedian of all time. And I found that fascinating because... When we hear the name Shecky, yeah. we, we associate it with comedy. We don't know why, but we just associate it with comedy. But more to the point, we associate it with bad comedy or old-fashioned corny comedy. Cat yet, skills were, kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and here were all these guys contradicting that assumption, saying this guy named Shecky was the funniest guy. So I wrote an article all about that, how – you know, his name has come to symbolize the opposite of what was the case. And in writing that article, uh, I think is what, uh, how Mark Marin found me. He read that article and that led me to eventually being booked on his, uh, his show. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a these, these stories of Shecky and, and, you know, get Shecky got beat up by the, by the, by the, by Frank, wasn't it? By Sinatra's goons. Is that what happened? Yeah, the Freshetti brothers, who are a mafia family from Chicago. <laughs> There's all of these revelations and fascinating anecdotes 
uh, in this book. The the feedback have you, you've gotten, I think, is generally quite favorable. Have you, from people who are either, uh, you know, people you spoke to uh, in the book, has anyone given you negative feedback or did uh, revealed to you that they were surprised by aspects of your book? Uh, I'm thinking more of the subjects of the book, I suppose. Yeah, I'm being sued right now. <laughs> really? Like, yeah. I'm always being sued uh, by a guy named, well, maybe I shouldn't even say. Yeah, don't get I'm in being, trouble. I'm being, I'm being sued by a guy who's uh, from the 70s, comedy store era guy who feels that I implicated him somehow in the death of somebody. Not true, by the way. I did not implicate at all. But I did have to provide my sources. My publisher's legal department was like, do you have sources for this sentence in your book? I go, yeah, I'll dig it up. And I found the interview with the guy and a transcript and then another book that uh, uh, also uh, sourced this information. And we had to change something recently in the audio book and in the Kindle and in any future editions of the book due to this guy's uh, complaint. Um, but, you know, it was... Uh, I don't feel that he was necessarily uh, correct or incorrect. I, I was not really pining for a fight, you know, so I actually didn't really care about changing one sentence just to appease somebody. But he's the only one that really complained. I thought I might hear from Don Rickles before he died or from Jackie Mason. Right. Because in the, bu in the book, I talk about how Don Rickles' career, the whole trajectory of it was changed when his management was, was uh, switched from this low-level guy named Willie Weber to a mafia guy <laughs> named Joe Scandori. And so, as soon as the mafia took over Don Rickles' career in 1958, suddenly he became famous. Right. And they, in fact, they built a nightclub just for Don Rickles in Miami Beach, a place called the Riot Room, which was a bar connected to a motel called the Admiral V Motel. The mafia built the club and put Don Rickles in it, and that's how we kind of uh, gained his chops. It became Don Rickles' uh, room, the riot room yeah. in Miami Beach. So I thought maybe I would hear from them because I'd never read anywhere else anybody writing about his connections to the mob. They only talk about Frank Sinatra's connections to the mob. But it was not really meant to in a defamatory way, but in a factual way. If you were a comedian in the 40s or 50s or 60s, nine times out of ten, you were working for the mafia or the mob, some sort of mob contingent in America. That was just reality, and it didn't matter what city you were in. Uh, the mob controlled nightclubs. It was just a uh, reality. So I thought maybe I would hear from him. I didn't. And then Jackie Mason was the other because Jackie Mason tends to sue a lot of people. He sued his own daughter at one point because <laughs> she was, she, she was doing stand up in the eighties uh, and was talking, telling stories about what it was like to have Jackie Mason as a father. So she, he sued her to stop her from doing stand up. And then denied that she was uh, his daughter, which of course she was. Wow. But but anyway, so I thought I might hear from Jackie Mason because nobody has anything good to say about Jackie Mason in my book. I interviewed all the old timers and uh, I interviewed this guy named Milt Moss, a very obscure comedian. And I said, uh, I said, what was this person like? What was that person like? He goes, oh, wonderful, wonderful. There was never anybody I ever met. Uh, who wasn't wonderful. Every person I ever worked with <laughs> was a wonderful, wonderful man. I go, what about, uh, I go, what about Jackie Mason? He goes, fuck Jackie Mason. What a scumbag. <laughs> so. It's a, it's a, you know, I actually took a, a photo of the section of your book that talks about the origin of stand up comedian and its connection to the mafia. The notion right. that the mafia would refer to stand up guys and stand up boxers and stand-up comedians were guys who told nothing but jokes, punch, 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 right? And I just yeah. thought that was – I'd never heard that before. And I use this as an example for people listening. This book, The Comedians, uh, just as a pop culture fan, even if, even if you – obviously, if you don't want to know about comedy, this is not the book for you. But if you're interested in the history of pop culture, it's just a remarkable, remarkable achievement. So for what it's worth for me, Cliff, whom you never met a guy in Guelph, the book is just uh, – I think it's wonderful. Oh, I mean, it means a lot to me. What are you talking about? That means as much as as, as anybody compliment. Okay, I appreciate it very much. Well, good. And I and this brings me uh, to funny how finally this is your new Viceland series uh, that's premiering uh, this month, July, and uh, I can't help but see it as a contemporary extension of the work you did uh, with the comedians. In that, you know, obviously you are taking uh, issues that pertain to comedy and, and talking to young people, active comedians and, and established comedians, and trying to get 
at them. Uh, talk about the conception of this show. Well, in a way, it's a it's a TV series that punctures my own pomposity because I wrote this book that's a history of stand up, and like you described me earlier as an expert or something, but. Uh, it's very uh, easy for that to go to one's uh, head. You know, you treat it as an authority. You start to act like an authority. And if you act like an authority, you're acting like a know-it-all. And in this TV series, in several of the episodes, I enter with a premise, thinking that I know something, only to have that completely shattered and dispelled by the end of the episode. So we did it. We did one episode where I shadowed. Uh, the subculture of Christian stand-up comedians around America. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't even know this is a thing, but there is a huge industry of Christian stand-up comedians that play uh, 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 a church circuit. We talked to a woman named Shonda Pierce who has a tour bus, sells out theaters. She's the top-selling Christian stand-up comedian in America. And we also shadowed a couple other guys through rural Michigan who were not famous who are doing small town gigs, towns of 500 people and 1,000 people in their local churches. And my prejudice at the start of the episode is the same prejudice that a lot of people probably bring to this idea. I'd mention it to people who were shadowing Christian stand-up comedians, and people would say to me, huh, Christian stand-up comics, well, are they funny? The assumption is that they're not going to be uh, funny. And the other assumption is that they're not regular comedians. But by shadowing these people around, I learned that the experience of the Christian stand-up comedian is identical to the experience of the secular stand-up comedian. Mm. You have somebody that's at the top of the food chain selling out theaters and, and signing autographs. Then you have these other poor saps who are slogging it on the road, who are getting stiffed on pay. They're doing a gig that they think is going to be great, and they show up, and it's a garage, and there's only 12 people in the audience. And uh, having done stand-up for seven, eight years myself, I know that that is part of the territory. You never really know when you're doing the road what the gig's going to be like until you show up. Mm -hmm. Often it's fantastic, and often it's horrible, and often it's the opposite of what you're expecting. But no matter what, it's always a hustle. It's always a hustle. Even for those that are at the top of the food chain, as we know, there's so many comedians that were at the top of the food chain and now can't sell out a comedy club, whether it's Yakov Smirnov or Gallagher or whoever. You know, yeah, there's always yeah. those people that were at the top and then now people don't care about. So that is part of the, the process of comedy. But in that episode, I kind of had my prejudices dispelled because a lot of these guys were funny despite their appellation as a uh, Christian stand-up comedian. Well, and the, then we, yeah, go so ahead. I was just going to say in the episode Queer How, uh, which in which you explore the uh, experience of LGBTQ comedians, there's a point where you're speaking with Cameron Esposito and, and Rhea Butcher, and you say uh, to them that you don't see comedy as a vehicle for social change. And Cameron's reaction in the moment is, oh, you know, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Is is the premise of the show that you come up with these uh, theories or these theses and then you try to prove or disprove them? Like, are you? It seems like a learning experience for you. Yeah, that was not uh, like initially the plan. That just happened organically, and we discovered as we filmed the the show that having it unfold that way uh, is a great story arc because it leads us from one place, takes us to another place. So Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher, when I talked to them, they did uh, give me a new and fresh perspective and kind of changed my mind. My assertion is based on what I've studied in history, mm -hmm. which is that everybody wants comedy to be a vehicle for social change. You hear a lot of cliches about how comedians hold up the mirror to society, the truth teller, blah, blah, blah. You hear about Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Lily Tomlin. And in the episode I mentioned that I don't feel – that comedy is a vehicle for social change because there's no historical evidence that it ever has been. Mm -hmm. There's no e example of comedy preventing fascism or genocide. And, you know, look what's happening in America now, despite the fact that we just had a decade plus of Jon Stewart on The Daily Show, Stephen Colbert's The Colbert Report, The Onion, great, cutting, brilliant, truth telling satire. And yet we have uh, a fascism on the rise here. So yeah, if comedy, yeah. if comedy were a vehicle for change, then it wouldn't. Then we wouldn't have swung this far to towards uh, fascism, right? Yeah. So that was my argument to them, and their response was, "Well, with all due respect, 
the people you just cited are all uh, white men who are part of the hierarchy. You mm -hmm. know, they're part mm -hmm. of the patriarchy. We as uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, women have never been the main representative in comedy. So every vehicle for social change in history, every social movement, whether it was the women's suffrage movement or the civil rights movement, has been predicated by minorities, not by the white men that were running things. Mm -hmm. So maybe comedy has not been a vehicle for change. But given the opportunity uh, that is opening now for people that are not necessarily members of that traditional patriarchy, maybe it now can become a vehicle for change, is yeah. what they said. Yeah, and it's it's very fascinating. Like, as I say, this this series looks uh, amazing. What I've seen, the two episodes I've seen so far were great. Uh, it did make me, th and in your book, The Comedians also conjured this for me, this notion that, you know, I've been following comedy my whole life. I've been studying comedy in some ways, but I can't recall a time where awareness of comedy was as high as it is right now, and also an interest in how comedy works, its efficacy, how it actually soup to nuts, how a comedian gets on stage, and you explore these things in the series. Why do you think there's this thirst and hunger to sort of humanize and demystify comedy? Well, comedy, uh, modern stand-up is a relatively new art form compared to music, compared to literature. Um, so we're now at a position where everybody kind of understands what it is. But prior to the comedy club era, there was not even a knowledge of how you became a stand-up. But now anybody who wants to become a stand-up can figure out the blueprint. You know, They can upload videos to YouTube. They know that there's an amateur night at a comedy club. But for a generation, that didn't exist. And comedy, stand-up comedy in particular, is even newer in Canada than in America. Uh, traditionally speaking, and this has been my observation, American audiences laugh much harder than Canadian audiences. <laughs> Canadian audiences are much tougher. But I think that's because the tradition of stand-up is older in America. People are just used to it more. And so there's an expectation about it. And I think that's changing in Canada uh, uh, now. Uh, so I don't know that there's a thirst and a hunger. There's a boom for sure. Uh, but with every boom, there's also a bust. So this bubble will probably burst sometime in the next, uh, uh couple of years. It is interesting when you watch stand up on YouTube and look at the comments, everybody in the comments is a goddamn comedy authority. Now and they'll be like, great jokes, poor delivery. And it'll be some guy, <laughs> some guy who's been doing stand up for 20 years, you know, they'll be like, Ah, uh, the first joke was good, but the guy needs better stage presence. I'm like, what? Wait, who says that? Who's on YouTube? You know, but everybody's an expert uh, uh, now, I guess. But uh, I don't really know what the thirst is, what the curiosity is. I think it's just sort of a renaissance of uh, of, of the time period. You know, people uh, uh, are interested in television now more than they used to be because it's better now. It's more sophisticated. So I, as any art form evolves, uh, so too does the sophistication of both the performer and the creator and the audience. There's more books about it. There's more specials about it. You're able to learn more about it than, say, in 1945. So Yeah, and I, I suppose with Netflix putting out basically a new comedy special now every week, people are bound to be like, what is up with this form, you know? Yeah, it's kind of a, not necessarily a good thing, though, because just because there's more comedy available, there's never more funny people, necessarily. The yeah. percentage of funny people on Earth uh, is probably the same today as it was 100 years ago, even if there's way more uh, stand-up specials now than there were 100 years ago. The thing that happened in the 80s that made that comedy boom bust uh, by most uh, assessments is that there was suddenly too much comedy. Yeah. But there, was, there wasn't more good comedy. There was just more stuff billed as comedy. And we might be suffering the same thing now because uh, you're a big comedy fan. I'm sure you watch a lot of those Netflix specials. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you find a lot of the Netflix specials as well that you don't necessarily enjoy. That's so, true. Yeah. So, so there might be more specials, but there's still going to be the same percentage of, of – quality specials so it's a risk in a way it's good for netflix in the short term but it might uh not be good in the long term it's sort of like uh 
uh, the oil industry here in America. Well, they're going to remove all the environmental regulations to make a massive profit now, but you won't be able to make any profit at all in 30 years when the world doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird, yeah. weird analogy to make. <laughs> well, I think Chris Rock famously told uh, a comedian that you got to make your special special. And obviously there's the uh, example of Mitch Hedberg sort of trying to do a special bombing and saying that, you know, referring to it as the Mitch Hedberg not special, right? I mean, there's there's something about these specials that uh, they've become a monster on some level. Well, Louis C.K., who I love, uh, maybe is is doing a disservice to his fellow comedians by put it, planting this seed in their brain that they need to come up with a new hour every year. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of comedians then are going to be trying to do a special before it's ready. You know, a lot of comedians in the old days, they would work 10 years before they taped a stand-up special. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in doing so, that stand-up special was fantastic. Uh, if you're trying to crank out a special uh, within a year and your material is not quite there yet, then that's going to do you a disservice. I remember when I was doing stand-up in 2004, I think, we did a showcase at the Comedy Club in Vancouver for CTV and their Comedy Now specials. And they were running out of comedians. They had done <laughs> specials of all the kind of well-known comedians, Brent Butt, Eric Tunney, Erwin Barker, Alan Park. They all had done, I guess, an hour special or a 40-minute special with commercials um, for, con for CTV Comedy Now. So they did a showcase of all us young comedians, and I did. we, we all did like five minutes or eight minutes. I did my five or eight minutes, and I killed. I had a great set. They came up to me afterwards. We said, uh, that was fantastic. We want to sign you for a special. I said, uh, uh, no, I can't do that. They said, why not? That was great. I go, yeah, but I only got five minutes. You can't. That's all I have. <laughs> they, said, oh, they said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll fix it in post. I said, no. <laughs> then I'll be rerunning on TV forever. People are going to say, that guy's not funny. Five started off started off strong with five minutes, but the other thirty five minutes were crap. So that's a huge risk if you're pressured into doing a special because it's a big uh, a boon for any comedian to be offered or granted a special on Netflix. Um, and there's probably a contractual obligation you have to deliver it by a certain date. But if you're not ready, you're not ready, and yeah. it takes more than one year to create an hour of stand-up that's truly strong. It hmm. really does. All right. Well, that's that's interesting. I uh, I I want to tell people that they need to go to, I guess, viceland.com to watch Funny How. Is that right? Well, they have to go to the Viceland channel on their cable TV. Okay. Sorry. So I didn't mean to... Oh, oh my God. Did I, did I just ruin your show? You just destroyed my show. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you can watch... I don't think you can watch it online. No. Okay. You have to watch it on TV. So it's uh, as on, far as I know. Okay. So do I'm people the, get that channel in Canada? Yeah, yeah. they don't get it here. Yeah. We, <laughs> oh, you don't have Vice down there? Huh. I guess they do, but everybody does exactly what you just did. They're like, I can't wait to watch your show. I'm like, oh, great. You're the first person I've met who gets the channel. They go, what? It's not on YouTube? <laughs> go, no, it's on TV. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> Well, it's on Vice, and uh, maybe somehow you can at least get more information about it at, at Viceland.com uh, or Vice.com. It premieres July 10th, Monday, July 10th at 11.30 p.m. on Viceland, which is a cable channel <laughs> on your cable package. <laughs> it's fantastic. What I've seen so far is fantastic, so uh, uh, I hope people check it out. And Cliff, where can people learn more about you? Uh, Twitter, Classic Showbiz, is where I usually am. Okay, so people can follow you at uh, Classic Showbiz. Cliff, this was uh, fantastic for me. Uh, I appreciate your time. I, I don't know if you're planning a sequel to the Comedians, are you? Not a sequel, but are you going to work on another book? I'm working on another book. Uh, I'm writing another cultural history. This one is about uh, lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. Oh, um, and if you read my book, The Comedians, there's a section in there in the late 60s where I talk about uh, LSD, about George Carlin, about Tommy Chong, about this guy Chris Rush uh -huh. who did acid and then got a record deal because he was so funny while he was on acid. Right. Um, so I'm writing a book about that. It's not just about comedy, but it's also about actors like uh, James Coburn, Rita Moreno, Jack Nicholson, Michael J. Pollard, Harry Dean Stanton, Warren Oates, all who did LSD and cited it as one of the most important experiences of their life. Um, a lot of musicians, a lot of philosophers, a lot of artists, 
uh, talking about how psychedelics uh, uh, shaped their universe and how it was used in the 1950s in therapy. Um, Bill Wilson, Bill W., the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, was so impressed by LSD's ability to cure alcoholism, which is what it was originally prescribed for in the 50s when it was legal, um, that at one point he was going to amend his 12-step program to a 13-step program, the 13th step being an LSD trip. <laughs> so, wow. I did not yeah. know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's, all, yeah. It's, all, it's all true. So that's what my new book is about. It's all those things that you didn't know about, uh, about LSD and um, sort of the culture behind the illegalization and how it was actually used to help cure drug addiction, help cure alcohol alcoholism very successfully but because of that art link letter story and other stories like that it was made illegal but it was sort of the original war on science despite all the scientific research despite all the uh, um, uh, very credible conclusions about its benefits it was all thrown out and made illegal because of this uh, uh, sort of uh, what's the phrase, apocryphal stories about yeah. what it would do negative that wasn't true. So I've been researching the Diane Linkletter story about the story is that Art Linkletter's daughter took LSD and then jumped off the balcony and committed suicide. Turns out, yes, she did jump off a balcony and commit suicide, but she was not on acid at the time. Mm. And yet Art Linkletter used that as sort of a banner cause to rail against uh, uh, psychedelics. And ever since then, people have cited that story as a warning against LSD, but the reality is she wasn't on LSD. So uh, a lot of my book has to deal with all that, the new book I'm working on. Very fascinating. I think it's good that you didn't uh, get to stay on as your school president and you got kicked out and uh, made it to America because I don't think we would be having these kinds of conversations. You would be doing this kind of work if uh, things had turned out differently. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be uh, living under the shadow of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you, uh, Cliff, uh, the best of luck with that and all your future endeavors. This was really a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the 331st episode of the Creative Control Podcast, this one with my special guest, Cliff Nesteroff. If you're new to the show, know that it's available on most podcast platforms, including iTunes, Audioboom, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, and more. Uh, if you want to go deeper into the history of the show, go to my website, vishkana.com, and you can learn more about uh, the program. And also, uh, as I say, listen to every single episode that may not be available on the, the feed on your respective uh, podcast platforms there. Also, we're on Facebook, like uh, Creative Control with Vishkana on Facebook. We're on Twitter, at Vish Creative. I'm on Twitter, at Vishkana. And a version of the show airs every Wednesday at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at CFRU.ca or if you're in the area of Guelph, Ontario CFRU 93.3 FM is where you want to tune in 93.3 FM Also visit uh, our Patreon page patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep the podcast going and view t-shirts that I have uh, as gifts for people who pledge This episode would not be possible without our sponsors Pizza Trocadero in Guelph. You can call them for pickup or delivery at 519-829-2444. The finest gourmet pizza uh, in Guelph and maybe even beyond. TrocaderoGuelph.ca for more info. The Bookshelf, an independently owned bookstore, bar, music venue, movie theater, and restaurant located at 41 Quebec Street in Guelph. Learn more about them at Bookshelf.ca. And some wonderful coffee, the best coffee. Planet Bean Freshly Roasted Fair Trade Certified Organic Coffee. Wonderful coffee. Visit uh, planetbeancoffee.com or one of their three cafes in Guelph uh, for delicious, hot, fresh, organic coffee. There you go. That's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Please continue to do so and tell your friends to do so. My name's Vish. I will talk to you soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>